Well, good morning, Walden Church. My name is David Kenny, and I am the pastor here, and uh, we have been going through the book of Matthew, and we got a couple more weeks, and then uh, it's going to be Mother's Day. So, yeah. Um, speaking of which, when you get married, there are even more family members that come into your life, not just the in-laws, right? Uh, for instance, my wife has a cousin that lives in New Orleans, which comes in handy when you're driving back through or you want to visit New Orleans. And originally, I had only heard about the culture there. I had never experienced it for myself. And if you go, especially if you take a stroll at night, you're going to notice that voodoo is a very strong practice there. And so is fortune telling, so is tarot reading. We walked around at night once and I was just surprised to see all these little tables set up and people charging $5 or $10 uh, to have someone read your palm or to read uh, tarot cards. So both as a Christian and as a, a person that likes to do magic tricks. Uh, I was very curious about this. One, I mean, because I am a magician, I know a lot of these fortune tellers and palm readers, they're just, they're just con artists and they're playing a part for the tourists. It, it's actually something that uh, Houdini spent the latter part of his life debunking. And as a Christian, it's also fascinating to me that there are so many people who are still very quick to believe in the supernatural or the spiritual world. But it's when they interact with the spiritual world, their, their questions and their concerns are not about the afterlife, right? They're not, they're, they don't want to know about heaven or hell. They don't want to know about the right or wrong way to live. No, the questions that they ask the tarot cards or the questions they ask the crystal ball are about love, and health and money. People are concerned with the things that are coming up in their life, right? How do I avoid the, the next couple pitfalls that might be coming up in my life? Which is weird to me because on the one hand, they admit that there is a life beyond the one we can see. There's a force perhaps that knows the future. And, and when I interact with this supernatural world, or perhaps when I interact with this supreme being that knows the future, I, I don't ask questions and I don't want to learn more about the next life. I want to learn about this life. Not what happens after you die. No, they want to know what happens just in the next couple years. Why? In Matthew 24, 35, Jesus says, heaven and earth will pass away. You know what I see when I look at the tarot cards? No more earth. <laughs> we just got through Easter, and in Easter, we saw a resurrected Christ. And it's a foreshadow of things to come. We will be like Christ. We will be resurrected. We will have a new body. So tell me something. Why, why do I care, then, about my health in the here and now? I mean, one day, I will have a new perfect body, and I won't ever get sick, and I won't ever age. I remember in my own lifetime, there was a gentleman named Harold Camping, and he published a book called 1994, and in it, he predicted that the world would end. And then in 1995, <laughs> he admitted, well, maybe I did the math uh, incorrectly. And then he changed the date to May 21st, 2011, and that came and went. And then he stopped making predictions. But let me tell you something. Picking a date and time for the end of the world, that sells books. If I started a Bible study or a sermon series about the end of the world, right, or, or Revelation, people would come. Everybody loves those end time, end of the world scenarios. And, and there's a lot of discussion about it. There's varying beliefs about it. Most of those beliefs are around uh, what Christians call the rapture and their idea that, you know, one day they'll fly off 
in the outer space to be with Jesus. And, and most of those varying beliefs are about when the rapture takes place. Does the rapture take place before the end of the world, during the end of the world, or after the end of the world? In fact, if you're ever curious about prophecy or about revelation, I did an online Bible study. Every single video is about 10 or 12 minutes. I did 64 of them. Uh, you can watch the entire thing and go through the entire book of Revelation with me. But you really shouldn't care about what I said. <laughs> and, and you really shouldn't care about who writes the next end of the world book. You should only care about what Jesus said. And ask yourself, what did Jesus say about the end of the world? Because that's the only thing that's important. Because he did. He did talk about it. He talked about it in Matthew. And we're going to look at that. And um, hopefully, we'll be able to rephrase our question. Because our question is typically, uh, when will it happen? Right? That's what we all want to know. When will it happen? But Jesus says, nobody knows. Nobody knows. So, really, then, the only question should be, is are you ready? Are you ready? That's the only question. That, and the answer to that question is not going to be found in your horoscope. It's not going to be found in tarot cards. It's not going to be found in a crystal ball. And the concerns that we have about this life, like relationships and money and health, those may seem like the most important questions, but they're not. Or at least they shouldn't be. So we're going to go back, once again, in the book of Matthew. We're going to go back so that we can look ahead to the years that are coming. So let's roll up our sleeves and see what Jesus had to say. Matthew 24, verse 1. Jesus left the temple and was going away when the disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple. But he answered them, You see all these, do you not? Truly I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. As he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us then, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered them, See that no one leads you astray. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place. But the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginning of the birth pains. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you'll be hated by all nations from a namesake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So this takes place after the triumphal entry, after Palm Sunday, right? And it takes place after Jesus speaks with the religious leaders, with his, his woes, right? And maybe, you know, he and the disciples, they're walking by the temple, and the disciples comment about how beautiful the temple is. And Jesus says, meh, it'll all be destroyed. And the disciples are in shock. They're in disbelief. And they say, when, right? Right, when? When will this take place? And so much of what follows uh, in Jesus' answer is a prophecy of the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. He is answering their question. In verse 15, he says, So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken by the prophet Daniel, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down to take what is in his house. And let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And the last for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, pray that your flight may not be in winter or on a Sabbath. For then there will be a great tribulation, such as not has been seen from the beginning of the world until now. No, and never will be. And if those days had not been cut short, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders, 
so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. So if they say to you, look, he is in the wilderness, do not go out. If they say, look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. Notice first, uh, he says, you're going to see a sign. And it's a sign that's in the book of Daniel. Uh, what is this abomination that he's talking about? Well, four times in the book of Daniel, Daniel mentions an abomination. And then Matthew has a side note in his text, and he kind of turns and looks at the camera. Do you notice that? He kind of winks at the reader. A and he says, you understand, right? Meaning, the thing that Jesus is talking about already happened by the time the reader is reading this. So about 40 years after Jesus says these words, in the year 70 AD, the Romans came and destroyed the temple. They, they destroyed, <laughs> destroyed all of it. They wiped it out. It's completely gone. Soldiers came in, they sacrificed unclean animals in the ruins, and they declared their emperor, who was the Roman leader Titus, a god. And, and this, is not, uh, this, is, this was not a small little war. It was, not a, it was not a skirmish. It was not a conflict. The Jewish war actually began a few years earlier in 66, and it was a direct revolt against Rome and Rome's authority. And Titus, with his legions, they came at the wall that surrounds Jerusalem, and they came right at Passover in the year 70. They built all kinds of embankments and battery, battering rams, and then they went to battle. And the Roman army, they say, was about 30,000 strong. Uh, the Jewish army was a little less at 24,000. But when historians write this down, they say that there was an, an additional 600,000 Jews in Jerusalem for Passover. After about five months, the walls came down and the great temple was burned and the city was left in ruin. And the only thing left pretty much in Jerusalem were these towers that Herod had built. By the end, over one million Jews were killed. 95,000 were taken captive as prisoners. And among them was Josephus, who was a Jewish historian. And according to Eusebius, the Christians at that time saw the Roman army coming and they were armed with this text and they fled, they ran away. So early Christians knew what to do because of Matthew 24, because Jesus warned them. He said, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down to the, take what is in his house and let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, pray that your flight may not be in winter or on a Sabbath, for then there will be a great tribulation such as not been from the beginning of the world until now. No, and never will be. Jesus says, don't go back for anything. Don't even defend your homeland. Run away. When you see Rome coming, run away. And it happened. And because Christians had listened to Jesus' prophecy, they were spared. Let's not run by this so fast, because this is the first thing we need to understand. Jesus said it would happen, and it happened. So Jesus made a prophecy, and it came true. What does that tell us? Well, it tells us that you can trust the authority of Christ, right? And that's the big picture message that is taught all throughout the book of Matthew. Time and time again, we see Matthew mention the authority of Jesus. He speaks, he heals, he has control over the supernatural world with authority. Last week uh, at Easter time, we see Jesus come back from the dead. And what does he say? He says, all authority on heaven and earth have been given to me. That's the lesson we learned from Easter. Someone dies and comes back to life you do whatever that person says. <laughs> They're in charge, right? Easter said that he had authority over heaven and earth. We listened to him. But there's more to Matthew 24 than just the end of Jerusalem. Uh, there's a second prophecy there kind of woven in there about the end of the world. 
In verse 29, he says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall down from heaven, and the powers of heaven will be shaken. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from the end of heaven to the other. So this is a new prophecy. This is a prophecy about his second coming, his return. And this is where a lot of questions pop up, because we read this, and then we get a little worried. And like people who read tarot cards or consult crystal balls, we want to know when, right? When is this going to happen? That's what the disciples ask. That's, that's what we do. We worry, right? We worry. So we want to know uh, a date and a time. Well, Jesus says it'll happen after the destruction of Jerusalem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that was a long time ago, <laughs> right? That already happened. So we're not even concerned about the destruction of the temple anymore. Now we want to know about the next big one. Well, actually, like many things Jesus teaches, his stories always have layers. He is primarily talking about the destruction of the temple, but there's also something there kind of hidden in for us that we should also notice. And that is all of the things of this world are temporary, right? The disciples see this huge temple and it's beautiful and it's a, it's a monumental task, right? A work of art to have built this thing. And they're so impressed with it. And Jesus says, meh, it'll, it'll be destroyed. He says, you, you, you see all these? Do you not truly, I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. Those stones that he's talking about, those stones that he's looking at, they're 30 feet long. 30 feet long, 12 feet high, 12 feet wide. They each weigh about 200,000 pounds. Stacked on top of each other. Long before we had advanced you know, equipment that could move things around like that. So, and, and the roof line, the roof line would shine in the sun because it was made of gold. The walls were white marble. So it would have been such an incredible building to look at. Massively impressive. And Jesus just kind of shrugs and says, you know, these big rocks that you're looking at, not one of them will be left standing. But this warning that Jesus gives, it's a good reminder for us too. I know, I know, it's, this happened a long time ago and the temple's long since gone, but the reminder is for us is that all of the things of the world one day are gonna be gone. All the things that you and I marvel at, all the things that we kind of place our lives on. In verse 35, Jesus says, heaven and earth will pass away. All of it. All of it. But, but one thing won't, Jesus says. One thing, and that is his word. He said, not my word. My word will not pass away. Which means Jesus isn't only just the authority he is the permanent authority, right? Jesus accurately predicts the destruction of Jerusalem, predicts the destruction of the temple. It happened. He's not a fortune teller, okay? He's not a tarot card reader. No, he knew that because he created all of it. He created the world. He has authority over the world. And he says, one day, it'll all be gone. You think that's bad? One day, it'll all be gone. And the things that we think are so important, the things that we worry about, the things that we hold on to, the things that we buy, they're all temporary, all temporary. So don't build your life on temporary things. Matthew 7, Jesus says a wise person builds their house on a rock. In other words, if you're smart, then you build your life on what's important. Well, what's important? 
what's permanent? Well, Jesus says the only thing that's permanent is his word, right? Everything else is going to be destroyed except his word. You know, the USA Today did a poll uh, about, um, from Americans, and they wanted to see what Americans were the most worried about, right? What are the things that you, Americans are most worried about? 81% said the future of our nation. Hey, let me just ease your mind, okay? One day, it'll be destroyed. 74% said they're worried about political unrest. Hey, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it anymore. Because Jesus says one day it'll be destroyed. 66% said they're worried about, still, still worried about the Capitol riot. Hey, you know that Capitol building that you think is so beautiful? One day, not one stone will be left upon the other. 70% are worried about our economy. Stop worrying. Enjoy it while you have it, because one day it'll be destroyed. 71% are worried about police violence. 55% are worried about race relations. 80% are worried about global pandemics. 66% are worried about access to healthcare. 70% are worried about food and clothing and housing. Wow, that is a lot to be worried about. Why are you so worried? Why are you so worried? Well, we're worried because we care. We care about those things. We think that all of those things matter. Jesus says they don't matter. 2 Timothy 3 says, in the last days there will come times of difficulty for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power, avoid such people. Second Peter 3 says, knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires, and they will say, where is the promise of his coming? You know, it's funny, everyone thinks that the devil comes to trick us by tempting us and that he purposefully lays traps and then we fall into those traps. I don't know. I think his time is better spent getting us to care and worry about things we shouldn't care and worry about. As long as we are glued to our TV, glued to the newspaper, glued to Facebook, then we are not focusing on the king and we are not focusing on the kingdom. Well, what about the president? Who cares? Term limits. <laughs> One day he'll be gone and then you can worry about the next president. Don't worry. Well, I just worry about the future. Okay, don't. Jesus says he alone has authority over heaven and earth. And he says, all of it is temporary. Why worry about something that is guaranteed to end and that you have no control over? The devil loves to make you care and worry about temporary things. Why do you believe what you believe? You ever stopped to ask yourself that? Like, I, like the end of the world, for instance. What do you believe about the end of the world? Guess what? It doesn't even matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter because it's going to happen. It's going to happen, and it's going to happen God's way. It's going to happen God's way. Matthew 24 says, Therefore, you must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming, at an hour you do not expect. Again, in verse 42, he says, Therefore stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. Verse 13, But the one who endures to the end will be saved. All through this chapter, Jesus says, Be ready, be ready, endure to the end. In other words, persevere. Persevere. The point of this passage is not to unlock the clues. I know, I know. You want a time, you want a date. Jesus isn't going to give you a stopwatch, all right? He doesn't want you 
to sit there and watch the clock. He wants you to pay attention to what matters. Because if you had a date and time, all you would do was hold up in a bunker somewhere until it was over. Verse 36 says, But concerning the day and the hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. Tell me something. Would you stand ready if you knew the date and the hour of the coming of the Son of Man? Would you, would you stand ready? Because I don't think so. I don't think you would. Jesus says, be ready, stay awake, persevere. That's what we are supposed to do. This is what he's telling us to do. Be ready, stay awake, persevere. We read in Matthew 24, we read this passage, and then we want to ask, when is this all going to happen, right? But Jesus sees where our heart is when we ask this question. Our heart is worried about things that are temporary. The point here is not to find a date. The point is that the world is temporary. It will pass away. And so until that happens, we hang on. We persevere. Well, what about all the, the lies that are out there? What about all the deception taking place? Jesus says it's going to happen. He says it's going to happen. What about all the false Christs and the false prophets? That's also supposed to happen. You can stop worrying about it because it's supposed to happen. What about all the wars and rumors of wars? Hey, nobody ever said life was going to be easy. Verses 7 and 8 says, For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All of these are but the beginning of the birth pains. This is all happening right now, right? Right now. Jesus could come back at any moment, right? True. But Jesus also says, when you see these things, that's only the beginning, right? That's only the beginning. And that makes us worried again. We're worried. We're afraid. We're worried about tomorrow. We're worried about our children's tomorrow. We don't want future generations to go through the same things we had to go through or for them to make the same mistakes that we made. Verse 6 says, And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place. What does Jesus say? Don't worry. Right? He says, don't worry. It's supposed to happen. It's designed to happen. Listen, don't let your life go up and down based on political unrest or natural disasters. This too shall pass. These things will come. These things will go. Presidents will come and go. Nations will come and go. Jesus says, see that you are not alarmed. Even if you think it's all in chaos, I worry about the fate of this, I worry about the future of that, I don't. You know why? Because I don't have authority over heaven and earth. Romans 8 says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is revealed to us. It's not worth it. John 16 says, I have said these things to you, but in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. 1 John says, do not love the world or the things in this world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. What does the Bible say? The Bible says, bad things are going to happen. Cancer is coming. Tragedy is coming. Death is coming. Jesus says, through it all, hold fast. Through it all, persevere. Right? Verse 10, he says, many will fall away. They will not persevere. They will fall away. Some believers will not hold fast. They will fall away. Listen, we face temptation every single day. Okay? And part of that temptation is to 
trust in myself, to believe that I can do it, or to trust in this world and to place my faith and my security and pretty much everything into this world, except trusting in Jesus. The world seems to want to push Jesus, push God more and more out of the picture. Jesus says, don't be alarmed. Don't be alarmed. Persevere. Even when you think, this, how could this get any worse? This, the world couldn't possibly get any worse. Jesus says, persevere. Even if you think you're the only one left. Verse 9 says, then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Hated. Hated because why? Because you're a Christian. Hated because you persevered. Jesus says you will experience suffering. You will experience opposition because you persevere. Jesus says while you're holding fast, expect to be persecuted. Don't act like you're surprised. What? I can't believe it. Don't, don't be offended, okay? <laughs> it's okay to be offended. There's nothing wrong with being offended. Own it. Jesus says expect it. Nobody said being a Christian was going to be easy. Jesus never said it would be easy. But what he did say, and what he did promise is, that while you persevere, he is there with you. Matthew 28, 20 says, I will be with you always till the end of the age. Through it all. So what are we, are we supposed to do while we persevere? Okay, so I'm persevering. What, what do I do while I persevere? Jesus says you proclaim the gospel. You be a testimony to all the nations. Verse 14 says, And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Notice, <laughs> when does the end come? Only then. When we go and make disciples of all nations. Have you ever heard of the 1040 window? The 1040 window is the rectangular area of North Africa, the Middle East, and Asia. It's approximately 10 degrees north and 40 degrees north latitude. The 1040 window is also called the resistant belt. And here's the important part. 61% of people living in the 1040 window have never even had a chance to hear about the gospel. And this statistic really puts into perspective this understanding that Two-thirds of the world's population, more than 4.4 billion people, live there. Joshua Project says approximately 61% of the individuals in the 1040 window live in an unreached people group. The 1040 window is home to some of the largest unreached people groups in the world, such as the Sheik, Yadava, Turks, Moroccan, Arabs, Pashtun, Jat, and Burmese. When does Jesus return? I don't know. Well, why hasn't he returned yet? Because we have not completed the task. What's the task? Go and make disciples of all nations. Jesus says, do that, and then I'll come back. You know a man by the name of John Currier, who in 1949, he was found guilty of murder, and he was sentenced to life in jail. Uh, part lay through his jail sentence, uh, he was transferred to work on a farm in Nashville, Tennessee. And he was sentenced to work on that farm as a day laborer throughout his life. And then in 1968, his sentence was dropped. And they had a letter that had that good news, but it never, never made it to him. John never saw the letter. He was never told anything about it. Instead, life on the farm went on as normal. He kept working, and he didn't see any future for himself. Certainly not freedom. John kept doing what he was ordered to do, even after the owner of the farm passed away. Ten years went by. There was a state parole officer. He learned about John's situation. He looked for him, found him, told him that his sentence had been terminated and that he was a free man. What do you think? Would it matter to you if someone had an important message the most important message for your life, and year after year, that urgent message was never delivered to you. We have already heard the good news. We've experienced Christ's grace. We know 
The people are set free. We need to do everything we can to get that message out there to reach people who are still slaves to sin. People don't need to consult tarot cards or crystal balls to learn about their fate. Their fate is already mapped out in the pages of the Bible. So let's just decide right now, you and me, let's just decide right now to stop getting swept away by the news and the political climate. Let's stop being swept away in fear by famine and war and death. Let's put aside all of our differences. Let's stop making enemies. Stop worrying. Stop panicking. And instead, start loving. Let's start preaching. Did you know that 19 out of 20 Christians, okay, 19 out of every 20 Christians, they became a Christian before they were 24 years old. After 25 years old, only one in 10,000 becomes a Christian. After 35, only one in 40,000. After 45, only one in 200,000. After 55, only one in 300,000. After 65, only one in half a million. The news of Jesus Christ, the gospel, the good news, is more urgent than anything else on television or Facebook. Jesus says, everything else will pass away. Heaven and earth will pass away. The only thing that will not pass away is his word. If you go all the way to the back of the book, you skip all the way to Revelation 21. It says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither there shall be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. See, we don't have to worry. Jerusalem's gone, heaven's gone, earth is gone. Jesus says, one day, it'll all be made new. Just like you, you'll be made new, you'll have a new body, and there'll be a new heaven, a new earth, and a new Jerusalem. So what do we do in the meantime? We persevere, we hold fast, and there's a tremendous urgency to get the good news out there. There's a tremendous urgency and a great responsibility to make the gospel known to all people. So, as you leave this place today, or as you go out into the world, know that it is a world filled with people who are lost in sin. But you have the answer. You hold the good news. You hold the letter that tells people that they have been set free, and that they are no longer prisoners. You have the light that is needed to shine in a dark world. And what do we do with light? Well, we do everything we can to let the world see it. Let's pray together. Lord, right now we pray for that 1040 window. We pray for areas of the world that have not yet been reached by the gospel. We pray for missionaries and people groups that are there, that they begin to work together, that missionaries are allowed into those places, that they find safe places to preach the gospel, that they find safe ways to give the word of God to people who need it. 
We pray that you encourage missionaries, that you embolden them, that you equip them, that you give them the strength and the finances they need. Lord, we know that you will one day come again. And we look forward to that day. Help each one here to persevere, to not get swept up by the things of this world, but to hold fast to the only thing that's permanent, and that is your word. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for what he taught. And we look forward to seeing him again. Amen. Hey, thanks for joining us uh, this Sunday. It's so great to see you guys. Of course, I want to remind you that we are here. We are here every single Sunday, uh, 9.30 and 11. Our 9.30 service is more traditional. We have a choir. We sing all your favorite hymns. And then at 11 o'clock, we have a contemporary worship service with a worship team. Come however you are. It's a casual service. Uh, in between those two times, we have coffee and donuts. So if you get here a little early or you want to stay a little late, you want to meet some other people, shake some hands, make some new friends. That's always good. Uh, we welcome you for that. Uh, if you've got children or you have youth, please come to our 11 o'clock service. We have a full-blown children's program. We have a youth program. And we also have youth group every Wednesdays at 6. So even if you don't attend our church, we would love to have your students come over for youth group. We will even feed them dinner. And we'll send them home to you in about an hour and a half. I love you guys. I'll see you next week. Bye.